Good. Okay, so you know uh, what the publication is, right? The answer is mm -hmm. given to you, right? It's the orange mm -hmm. book, recommendation orange on the transport book. of dangerous goods, right? Because this is those committee of experts guys that started the first work when it came to identification and classification and listing and labeling of dangerous goods. Yeah, so they are the ones who actually started the whole system of UN numbers and PSN, what we're going to learn later today. Yeah. Um, Drish, where did you make your mistake? The same, same one. one. The same, same one, same one. Yoen, where were your mistakes? Yeah, you got to put your mic on, young man. No, actually it's on, but I can't hear you. Still cannot hear. Mic is not working, I think. It's not unmuted. I mean, it's not muted. It's unmuted, but I can't hear you. I think no one can hear you, right? Am I right to say that? Yeah. 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 How you give me, okay, never mind. It's all right. Okay. So anyways, the answers are given to you after, uh, Divya, were you able to get your result? No, it show all the green color. It means if that, wrong means. That, yeah. If all green color means right, la, you got it all right. Am I right to uh -huh. say it? Yes. Saswin is the one who got all right. Uh, yeah. Nanmuli got all right. So it shows all right. It's all green color, right? Yeah. It should give you the result. All right. Mr. Ong, how are you doing there? Oh, Mr. Ong, I cannot hear you. I, I did ten correct out of eleven. So the one you made a mistake in is which one? Do you know? Not indicated. I can't find out which one I got wrong. All right. So okay, never mind. Now let's let's pay attention to me right now. Okay. So um, now part of this e-learning, I know, as you can see here, uh, first and foremost, you can always um, every time we finish a class. I will be recording the classes like right now I'm recording this session, right? So every time we have a class, I will record the class and I will put the video out. I'm going to pause the recording now because this is pointless to page. All right. Now, yesterday, uh, when I started part one, I spoke about um, when you start opening the IMDG code book, the first thing in the forward they will talk to you is about certain symbols that would i would that would indicate to you that whether something new has been added to the code or something has been changed or even deleted from the code so when you take the dgl for page 195 the dangerous goods list short form is dgl and we're going to keep calling that from now on yeah i'm going to start using the acronym so you understand them from now on so when you look at page 195, you will see because this DGL, when you open it, there are 18 columns in there and the columns are indicated in brackets. And when you go to the first column itself and you look on top where it says UN number, that's your first column, you will see a triangle on the side there. So which means that within these columns, there has been some changes made. And the changes that are made is if you look at column number four, now, column number four says subsidiary hazard in brackets. There's an S, right? Now, that used to be known as subsidiary risks. So all the words that were used, where they use risk, those words have been interchanged with the word hazard now. So what they did is they'll put one triangle there and tell you, because they cannot everywhere put triangle be so messy. So they put a triangle in the beginning there to tell you that every part where the word risk comes in, the DGL, they have now uh, interchanged it with the word hazard. And now when you look at that UN number column one also, and you go all the way down to the final UN numbers, where you see a bullet um, at the beginning of the number. And those bullets, that 3535, so that's a UN number for you. This numbers, 3535, 3536, 37, 38, 39. And if you look at page 196, it goes on to all the way down to 3548. So these are the new UN numbers that have been introduced in the version 3918. Also, did you download um, special provisions? 
Yeah. So can you take the special provisions as well? Can we take a look at them as well? Yeah. So open the special provisions and Excuse uh, me? yes. Yes. Uh, just now you talked about which part? <laughs> I'm lost. Okay. Did you download the dangerous goods list? That no, I, I didn't. I didn't. See, I told you to do that yesterday, did I not? Yes, yes, I just realized. Yeah, okay. you see, you have to be prepared for these classes because now, unlike in a normal classroom, it's different. You have all these things with you already. When you come to an yeah. e-learning, you are going to slow everybody down. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, please. Okay. And... Um, I'm going to open one of the DGLs, okay? All right. So this okay. is what I wanted you to open up, uh, what I wanted you to download, actually. This document. See, when I open the document on the screen now, let's try and make it bigger. Can you see it? Is it big enough for you? Nanmali, can you answer me? Somebody answer me whether this is big enough. You got to put your mic on because I'm not looking at you guys here. Yeah? I am now opening my full screen. Can you can see a bit now. You can see a bit, Ajay. Ah, small, very small, right? <laughs> yeah, so that is the reason why we asked you to download it, okay? Because okay. when you see this triangle, you see a triangle here where my mouse yeah. is hovering over. This yep, indicates yep. that there has been some changes made in this area okay. of the DGL. This document is called a dangerous goods list. Short form is DGL. For okay. our lesson today, you can immediately open yours and do this. See this? Or if you have a printer connected to your laptop right now, click this. Okay? And you get this printed out and you keep it on your table with you. You need it for today's class. All right? Um, anyways, where was I? I want to go back here and I want to show you the other DGL, not this one, the final DGL. All of them are coming out now. So that is the reason why I needed you all to please download these things because you see what a pain it is to do it while we are having a class. So I believe this is the one that I wanted to show when Anmuli missed out. Okay, Anmuli. Now what I was referring to to show you what is new are these bullet signs that I spoke about yesterday where I said that in the code book, in the IMDG code, when you open the first volume in the forward itself, they tell you about these symbols. So you understand what has been added to the code, what has okay. been removed from the code, and what has been changed. Now what I've showed you is what has been added and what has been changed. The triangle indicates a change. So what I will now show you is I asked you to also download this uh, special provisions. This is your, I'm opening up the special provisions now. So in this, these are your special provisions. Now in the special provisions itself, here you can see certain, it's because I have downloaded this from uh, my soft copy. This is not a photostat copy from the IMDG code book. The IMDG code book, you get your hard copy and you and you also get, or you used to be able to get a CD-ROM copy where you can uh, download uh, their program and you have the entire code book in a soft copy. So this is from the soft copy. But when you open the actual, what you will notice where you see this 182, 183, and then immediately 188. So there's like 84, 85, 86, 87. Then only came 88, so you will actually see a circle with an X sign here to indicate that, um, you know, that there has been some deletion. All right, so this is also a document that I need for you to have for today's class, okay? So, um, Nanmuli, um, 
where are you? I want to see all your faces. Can you please, for those of you who did not download it, can you please do that? Yeah? Yeah. I can download can these things because we need it today. Otherwise, you will be totally and completely lost. So now I'm going to move our class to our first um, uh, part of the part two of our training. I'll run this pretty quickly. I'm just going to touch a little bit on the physical and chemical uh, properties. Are you able to see my screen, everyone? Yes. Yes, okay. So I'm just going to do a simple thing. I'm not going to go too long. Just run these slides very quickly with you. And um, for you to have an understanding on certain terminologies that will ultimately, oh, you I will see. see the you can't, who, who is this? Yeah. Saswin. Saswin, wait, hang on. Yeah. Uh, Right. Thank you for Me telling. Too, I see. No, because I didn't share the screen, so I'm surprised oh, how yeah. anyone <laughs> saw the screen or so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so where was I? Oh, wait a sec. I haven't plugged in my computer. Hold on a sec, yeah? Otherwise, suddenly, pop, the whole session is gone. So, wait. Just, I'm going to pause the share. And I'm going to pause the encounter in the safety data sheet. And even when we are going through like uh, classes and uh, when we come to the concept of packing group, as well as um, when we look at the UN packing approval code. So this is like very basic stuff, okay? And just bear with me for a little while. So in order to really appreciate um, dangerous goods and the hazards and the danger that they pose, it, it becomes necessary for us to understand just um, simply for a, for a very, in a, in a simple sense about basic, um, sorry, basic chemistry and um, uh, uh, physics. So let's learn some simple terms, like let's understand what is physics first. So physics is the study of basic laws that govern the universe. Generally, what it means, it's, it is the study of energy, uh, anything. So energy in the form of heat, energy in the form of pressure. Um, that is what physics is. And it's all about math. That means everything and anything can be quantified. Um, then you have this other natural science, which is a very important natural science. I mean, there are three natural sciences that we know of, uh, physics, chemistry, and biology, right? And the second one that, because we're not going to touch biology, we're not, we're not learning anything to do with that. So we're going to touch chemistry basically, but we also need to appreciate how the law of energy, which is physics, how does that actually change the structure of um, of, uh, of a, a, a substance, so to speak. Um, so chemistry is the science of elements. Generally, what chemistry means is um, it defines to you in terms of atoms and bonds what something is made out of. Uh, as us, like we are also carbon. We're made out of, there is a structure that we can use the language of chemistry to define what we are. So chemistry talks about uh, the element, and physics is the law of energy. So in order for us to understand the hazards behind dangerous goods, we need to first associate ourselves with how physics or the law or energy, how does that correspond to uh, the chemical changes or the structural changes that takes place in substances or, or, or yeah, uh, well, yeah, substances or compounds of dangerous goods. So in, when we go a little bit more detailed in the chemistry, we look at these three branches. Um, one is physical chemistry. Physical chemistry is the effect of a chemical structure on its physical property. That means a chemical structure's shape, color, odor, whether it's soluble or whether it's not soluble, it's melting point and whatnot. And this is what you would see actually in the first entry in uh, section nine of the safety data sheet. The first thing they would do, or even when you look at the dangerous goods list and you look at column number 17 of the DGL, in that they will give you 
the physical property of the chemical. That means if the chemical or the compound has any smell, whether it has any color, whether it's miscible or immiscible with water, whether it's soluble, whether there's a specific boiling point or a melting point, or in the case of flammable liquids, you'll even talk about flash points, yeah? So um, then we get into the other two um, sort of like uh, branches or, or divisions of chemistry. One is organic chemistry. This is the chemistry of carbon compounds. These are either natural, synthetic, or those kind of compounds that are mixed between natural elements and synthetic materials. And you have inorganic chemistry. Now, inorganic chemistry is actually devoted to substances that are not considered organic. That means they are not, uh, they are not carbon compounds, all right? Uh, they are derived from minerals, sort of like iron ore or salt. So those are known as inorganic. And chemistry can be divided into also a sub-branch, which is called polymer chemistry. Now, the sub-branch of polymer chemistry, this chemistry is the study of large mo molecules. They call this macromolecules, which consist of repeating units of small molecules within their monomers that can be naturally uh, synthetic. And these are some basic terms that one would refer to like in chemistry, like you have elements and elements, the elements are generally the building box or the, sorry, the building blocks from which chemical structures are made out of. They cannot be broken down and they are composed of identical atoms, which are the smallest particles of an element that can chemically exist. Now, atoms consist of dense nucleus. That means there's a wall, a dense nucleus containing of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons. This thing orbits surrounding a nucleus and uh, surrounding this nucleus are small negatively charged electrons in the same number as the protons to make an atomic charge neutral. Now, why do we need to understand this? Because when we understand this, we will understand where, why radioactive materials actually uh, release radiation. It all has to do on how the atom is constructed. Now, these are some examples of elements, as you can see on your screen, and the symbols of these elements. This is just basic stuff, you know. But let's go to these um, terminologies. And these terminologies you will see in the safety data sheet. For instance, you will notice there are some substances that are known as mixtures, and some are known as compounds. When something is a mixture, you can blend them together. So you can blend it and then it forms into something else. Whereas when it is a compound, you need to heat these things together. When it's a mixture, like for instance here, each element retains its individual physical and chemical characteristics and can be separated because you are not applying any energy like heat to um, change its structure so that it could then form into something else. When you heat up two elements, what happens is when you heat it up, the way the atoms are arranged, it then changes its structure because it combines and forms into a new substance altogether. So mixtures are different from compounds in that that mixtures can be separated, but compounds cannot be separated and if you do separate it then you will have to it will decompose you have to heat it up in order to decompose it it decomposes and it releases some form of gases as the examples that are given on the screen the imdg code um wait, uh, the imdg code and codes relating to transport and handling of dangerous goods refer to dangerous goods in these two um definitions. They say that dangerous goods are substances and articles that cause harm. So when they refer to substances, what they're referring to are generally chemicals. And what we spoke of yesterday, the three forms of these chemicals. And when they refer to articles, what they're referring to are devices. It are, these are devices that if they only when they contain dangerous goods, these articles then become articles of dangerous goods. If they do not contain it, then it's not, 
it is no it is no longer considered an article of dangerous goods so this is what we saw yesterday the physical state of chemicals that you have them in gas uh, sorry you have them in solid you heat it up it melts into liquid you heat it up it evaporates into gas right and you can do the reverse to it so this is how the chemical structures of um, solids yeah liquids and gases look like yesterday i tried i attempted to draw this on the whiteboard and when we talk about um, physical properties of chemicals and especially when we want to identify whether these chemicals are construed as hazardous or dangerous we will look at physical properties such as boiling point so boiling point is a point where in temperature the liquid turns from liquid it turns into a gas form or a vapor form the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the ambient pressure that means the ambient pressure that is currently right now and bubbles of vapor like gases form directly in the liquid and you notice that you take a glass um, container and we've done that in school right and we have boiled the water and we've seen at what temperature the bubbles start forming so that is what this whole uh, uh, sentence is trying to explain here the normal boiling point is specified when the ambient pressure is equal to one atmosphere and thus the vapor pressure of the liquid equals to one atmosphere at a normal boiling point i know it sounds crazy but you will understand what atmosphere pressure is 101.13 kpa all right so you need to know the boiling point because volatile liquids if they have very low temperature boiling points that means at very low temperatures these fellows start heating up and forming into gases and when it is a um, volatile liquid and it starts behaving in that manner the gases that are forming now are flammable gases so that is that is what we're worried about when we transport dangerous goods so we must understand the nature of these chemicals another thing we look at is uh, we look at is uh, vapor pressure as well so vapor pressure will also take place in a situation where you have a uh, a very low boiling point or flash point of a chemical or even in a specific type of a gas that at certain pressure or temperature what happens is the uh, the vapor uh, uh, starts forming yeah and it starts expanding and then um, you know it starts uh, uh, trying to pull out of its receptacle now vapor pressure is the pressure caused by evaporation of liquids and what are the three factors is that the liquid or the gas is in a confined space that means there's a receptacle where it is within and that um, it is heated up it goes under some form of heating or pressure where then what happens you have intermolecular forces that make these um, uh, atoms those uh, little molecules that i showed you start expanding and trying to get out of the receptacle that it's caught in and it's important to know that because then you would need to know to what pressure would the receptacle need to withstand during the transit of this kind of products yeah here this shows you vapor pressure and then you have flash point and this is really important especially when it comes to sea transportation because a volatile liquid i use the word volatile and i'm going to use it very very um uh, you know uh, often uh, during our training because when we talk about dangerous goods we're talking about volatile goods they're violent they don't behave normally in normal situations they misbehave they start changing their form and when they start going through chemical changes what happens is they start then um, uh, um, demonstrating all these hazards that we spoke about explosions and whatnot right um, so volatile liquids when they have a temperature of that means when they do i will show you a video like i have an old video but it's a good video because it when it comes to class three um, it uh, shows you these two tests that are done for 
uh, flammable liquids. They are known as flashpoint tests, closed cup tests and op open cup tests. So in a closed cup test, they put the liquid in a cup, uh, they close it, they introduce heat to it, and they see at what temperature does the liquid change into a gas. Uh, the same thing they would do with the cups open. So obviously the temperatures where the liquids will change to gas in an open cup situation would be higher. And in a closed cup situation, it will be lower. We will always look at the closed cup temperature level for flashpoint because we, number one, you're packing this into enclosed receptacles. And number two, they're being packed into a closed container, right? So the temperature that we are interested in, in order to communicate or what actually defines a volatile liquid as a flammable liquid is when the flash point is 60 degrees Celsius and below. So that means at any temperature between 60 degrees and lower than 60 degrees, if the chemical, the liquid, changes from a liquid and uh, forms into a gas, that liquid is known as a flammable liquid. If it is above 60 degrees, it's usually known as a combustible liquid. Right? So flash point information is extremely important. We will come, we will also learn more about Flashpoint when we come to class three, because that is when we get introduced to what is known as the packing group concept. And how does that fit into a class three in this situation using the Flashpoint information? They use Flashpoint uh, as the main criteria and boiling point as well. So he, this is for uh, auto ignition is something that we would look, for, look at for flammable solids, even liquids for that matter. This is a temperature at which a liquid or a solid must be raised. That means at what temperature the solid or liquid has to be raised to cause sustained fire or explosion when touched by a flame or a hot object or by heat generation generated during the reaction or by friction. So there are some uh, flammable solids. Now they fall under the class fours. We'll come to that when we do the classes. So the first one, which is 4.1, flammable solids that are, are readily combustible. Some of them can just through friction, that's it, start ignition. They start catching fire. So auto ignition temperature is very important. You need to know at when you are moving, when these goods are in transit, they go through various temperatures, you know, depending where the consignment is moving from. So... Um, Auto ignition temperature is another value that you will see in section nine of the safety data sheet. This is explosive limits of a certain substance. This is the percentage of volume vapor over air concentration of a substance which is ignitable. So there are two things here, the um, lower explosive limit and the upper explosive limit. That means when, it, when a substance or when a product is uh, in the lower explosive limit, limit, the mixture or that substance is too uh, lean for it to ignite, to start burning. And uh, those and the, and the upper explosive limit is the level or the mixture is in such a point where even at this point, it cannot explode. Now, in between both these points, the LEL and the UEL, is where you have the explosive range of a substance. That means at, um, at this air concentration of this much volume of air, all right, and uh, uh, volume of vapor is where the substance will uh, explode. Now, this is about melting points. And there are some substances that have, uh, that have to be cooled during transit. And at certain temperatures, they start melting. And then the melting causes um, a whole range of uh, hazards, all right? So melting point is the point at which, or the point in temperature at which a liquid changes um, into uh, a solid, all right? So uh, during transportation, care should be taken on packaging material for solids, which have a relatively low melting point. Since changes in climatic temperatures during carriage can change the solid into a liquid. So there are some of them that we need to pay very close it, uh, attention to their melting points, especially if these melting points are rather low. And then there's density. And we need to know density when we are filling a receptacle. 
we want to fill a receptacle with a volatile liquid in a drum or even an IBC or in a portable tank, in an ISO tank. You need to know how dense is that liquid. And whenever we look at the denseness of liquid, we are looking at it in, rel in, in relation to the denseness of water. So when you look at water's uh, mass and, and volume, the density, that means one kilogram of water equals to one uh, cubic meter, all right? Now that would give you the denseness. So when it comes to water, water's relative density is one. But what we want to do, whenever we want to fill a receptacle, a drum, a uh, 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 IBC, a tank, we need to know the relative density of that substance because you need to know till what level will you be able to fill. So this is related to also viscosity of the substance. The denser it is, the more viscose it is. The lesser dense it is, the lesser viscose. The lesser viscose it is, that means the fellow moves a lot. And when it moves a lot, as it moves, it creates heat because of the energy, the kinetic energy of moving, it starts then creating heat. And then the heat will start the whole process because that's your physics, right? It'll start the whole process of heating up the liquid and the expansion starts taking place. The vapor starts building up. The vapor starts expanding into gases and they start forming gases. And if we do not know these things and we just fill the receptacles without any regard to such things, what will happen is there will be an explosion from that package. So it's very important to know uh, relative density, especially when we want to do filling of a substance. It is super important. Another thing that you would see is solubility and miscibility. So solubility is one substance in lesser quantity is dissolved in a solution in a greater quantity, like sugar, when you is soluble in water, water is not soluble in sugar, meaning I need to have a big uh, container of water and mix a tablespoon of sugar in order for that sugar to become uh, soluble. But I cannot take a, a, a kilogram of sugar and take a tablespoon of water and throw into there and expect that to be soluble, all right? So this is how you understand solubility. Now, miscibility is a different thing. Miscibility is you mix something. For instance, um, you take um, kerosene oil. You pour it into water. Will kerosene oil mix with water? It won't. It will stay on top. So what, what that means is it is immiscible with water. Why do we know, need to know this? When something is immiscible with water and if it is lighter that means it's less dense than water it's 0.5 la okay what it'll do is it'll hang on top of water and when it hangs on top of water then sunlight oxygen all blocks so that is a marine pollutant right there for you it's going to kill everything in in its vicinity by not allowing sunlight and oxygen to go through all right so we need to know solubility miscibility and now we look at the hazardous chemicals and their reaction. So the UN Committee of Experts on the Transport of Dangerous Goods, they developed a system knowing that now we have more and more. Of course, the system started in 19, uh, uh, 1950s, right? In 1959. And then, yeah, they perfected it again somewhere around the 90s. But when more and more chemicals, and now our dependence on chemicals are extreme so the we cannot do without them in a sense that they have to move and the only way that we can make sure that the planet is safe and that everybody in the transport chain is safe when when these goods are being moved is to follow um, the prescribed rules and regulations related to ensure that these packages are handled and transported safely now if somebody tells you to do something gives you a rule and doesn't explain to you why do you have to follow that rule, chances are you might not really follow that rule. I mean, um, that's uh, even right now with this, uh, you know, I, I honestly, this is digressing a bit from here. Uh, let's take the COVID-19. I still think a lot of people are very ignorantly, blissfully ignorant. 
still aren't very um, convinced of how dangerous this thing can actually be. I mean, maybe you think you're healthy, you can get it, and nothing will happen to you, but then you have no idea how many people's lives you can potentially cause. So uh, same thing, we apply the same rules when it comes to these kind of things. When it comes to moving dangerous goods that has a potential of actually damaging the planet that generations cannot um, uh, enjoy it, uh, it then becomes our... Uh, social responsibility as a human being on this planet to understand, appreciate, and learn how do we move these things in such a way because we can't do without them in such a way that it is always safe. Yeah? So that's the reason why this whole system came about where they gave you um, a whole classification system and they say that the classification system is actually uh, a number of classes that is based on the chemical reaction that takes place when these extremely volatile and um, uh, uh, highly reactive, unstable uh, substances are transported because they don't uh, behave like normal substances. So they came with how uh, flammable substances will react with oxygen and what could happen from it. And um, what could happen uh, when you are exposed to toxic toxicity or when a toxic substance is released in an environment? What can solid dangerous go goods uh, do in terms of their reaction when they go through these chemical reactions and so on and so forth? And radiation from radioactive uh, materials can damage your DNA. And um, the more you are exposed to it, the highly likely you will end up with cancer. Yeah? And... Uh, also, because now under the UNCOE, we also have everything now harmonized with the global harmonized system, the GHS. So the global harmonized system is actually the system where you will see the manufacturers uh, use um, uh, as part of uh, DOSH or, or occupational skills, um, uh, Department of Occupational Skills uh, and, uh, so, uh, uh, and Health, uh, where it is actually a law, uh, it is part of an act under the OSHA's act where uh, manufacturers of dangerous goods have to adopt the, uh, the guidelines of the global harmonized systems in identification, classification of substances, um, in uh, communicating these hazards using a safety data sheet and also indicating pictograms on the inner packages of uh, the packages containing these kind of uh, products. So they have these guidelines in terms of what the colors mean, like color, when you see a blue, generally it means that um, it's a health hazard, uh, it may cause irritation. This is the, under the GHS, yeah? And then uh, the green, so some are common, some you would see are common uh, even for road transportation, like for instance, yellow, uh, refers to some kind of oxidizing substance. They are very or that have extra oxygen components because they are unstable, um, very thermally unstable, and any kind of um, reaction, any kind of movement or friction may actually uh, make these guys uh, get these types of products to start reacting. These are the flammable ones, and these have specific hazards. Yeah. All right, so now that I'm done with that, I am going to move straight into classification. All right, so before I go there, wait, let me take a look at how my class is looking like. All right, just so to see whether you guys are with me. So um, do you have any questions in there? Yeah, can you repeat the density part? Uh, what does density mean, you mean? Yeah, how it works. Uh, All right. I kind of lost there. Eh? Okay. Um, you have to look at, uh, let's take it in a very uh, simple uh, perspective because uh, you, you see there what does density mean? Density means mass over volume. That means the weight divided by the cubic uh, area of the, the product or the substance, all right? And that would give you, uh, when you divide that, that would give you the density of that substance. Here they have given examples. Um, 
you're still looking at my screen, right? Yeah, so yeah. they give you examples here. They say, okay, mild steel, look at that, 7.9 kg over an M3. So that is the denseness of mild steel. And then look at wood. Now, okay, let me use a, a simpler example, okay? A simpler example would be one liter of water. How heavy is it in kg? One liter of water. Should be one kg. Exactly. So which means the density of water is one to one, yes or not? Right? Yeah. So yeah. there are some uh, substances. Let's take um, palm oil. All right. Now, palm oil, if I were to um, compare it to, um, uh, to water, and I wanted to know that uh, when, say, if I, if one cubic meter, I take the M3, right? I take one uh, liter of water and I, I find out its uh, density in terms of its cubic capacity and I use that, you will always get a number one. And then I take the same example with some product that is heavier than water, like palm oil. And I look at its denseness, that means how many, lit uh, how many uh, liters of this would make one kg, let's put it that way, all right? You will notice that there are certain products where you may have to get Two kg, uh, two liters of that substance to make one kg, to make the weight of one kg. So two liters means more, right? That means there's, in terms of quantity of that liquid, there is more quantity, can? Because water, yeah. you just need one liter of that water to make one kilo of weight. But here I tell you this other substance, I need two liters of it to make one, one kilo of weight. So that means that that substance is not dense. It's less dense. It's very light. It's probably half the weight of water because you need two amounts of it. But then now I take another very heavy uh, 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 substance. That means I've mixed things in it and it has become very dense. So let's take like paint. Okay. The paint without okay. mixing any water, the one we opened the can of paint. Now, when I want to know, I would uh, want to know how many, how many liter of this can of paint will make one kg. I will notice that I will not be able to reach one liter. It will probably be 800 ml or 700 ml, and that will be equivalent to one liter, uh, sorry, one kg. So which means now that that um, paint is heavier, denser, than water. So when something is dense, you can feel more. Why? Because it doesn't move much in its receptacle. Because remember, when you talk about volatile liquids, every time they move, they are going to heat up and they're going to form into gases. And when you okay. put them in a closed drum or something, and you do something, you 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 take a, a very less yeah, dense, that means a, a less a less viscous substance. You put it filled up in a drum, right? And then it moves and it moves, or or you you don't you give space for it to move. Sorry, it moves and it moves and it moves and it moves. And as it is moving in that space that you have allowed, it is now forming into gases because it's heating up. Then the gases in the heat start expanding and it will burst out of the receptacle. So that is the reason right. why we need to know relative. Now, do you understand relative density? Yep, yep. Okay, all right. Any other questions before we move? What about them? Sorry? I'm going to ask you the flash point. The flash point for the only for liquid goods only. Yes, flash point only occurs for liquids because flash point is a word that they use. Actually, what is it? Is it, it is a temperature level. That means mm -hmm. they are using this fancy word called flash point to define a temperature level where the liquid turns into a gas. So which means flash point only relates to liquid. The word will re relate to a temperature where a liquid changes to gas. 
So what is the dangerous temperature level? The dangerous temperature level is 60 degrees Celsius and below. So any temperatures 60 degrees and below, that means any chemical, liquid chemical, that changes into gas, say, at uh, 40 degrees Celsius, that's a flammable liquid already. Right? So more than 60 degrees? If it is above 60 degrees, I mean, it is still under the class 3 flammable liquid. But um, in, um, let's see, in a hazard sense, what they call it is above 60 degrees are known as combustible liquids. So combustible means they'll catch fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. combustible means can burn. So that doesn't mean that it's not dangerous. They must say dangerous. Tapi your level of danger is kurang daripada uh, liquids that have a low flash point. Like you take an example. Now when we come to classes, I will come back to that. Where I will give you the example you think about petrol and kerosene. They are both flammable liquids. But you definitely know in your head which is more dangerous between one and the other. Right? Uh, yeah. Because kerosene, I also drank by mistake when I was a kid. I'm still alive. I never tried <laughs> petrol and I wouldn't dare to. Okay, that was a mistake. One silly auntie never mark and label the bottle she kept in her house. So why do you mm -hmm. think I'm doing DG training? When I was eight years old, I suddenly drank at, uh, what uh, kerosene in one auntie's house. Because last time we used to have 7-Up bottle in the green bottle as well. So she went and put the kerosene in the green bottle. I thought water. <laughs> Lucky didn't die. Maybe that's why a bit gila. Anyways, any other questions? Because I'm now going to play that video for you. Okay. Now, again, I'm going to warn you. The video is an old video. Maybe older than a bunch of you or it not even born at that time. Okay. So. Madam, I think you have mute the video. Can you see the video? Did anyone try saying anything just now? Yeah, because yes, the video hear, was stopped. Yeah, we couldn't hear the audio earlier. The you can't hear the audio again. of the video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, wait. Can you... No, I think just now, Madam, your mic was muted. That's why. Okay. Now, all right. Can you hear it now? No audio. No. Nope. <laughs> no. No, nope, you can hear. Okay, let me. I'm going to turn off my mic. All right. And I'm going to look at you all and then you tell me whether you can hear it. Okay, hold on. You still cannot hear. That is very weird. See, I'm going to put this loud. Oh, it's so loud for me, but I'll try and see whether this works. Still nothing. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Okay, tell you what, let's abandon the video, okay? I'll put the video on the, this thing and then you guys watch it in your own time and space. Lah. Okay? We go straight to sharing the slideshow orders. We're wasting so much of time and I can see how bored you all are beginning to look. 
Okay, so now we go into classification. And you can all see my screen. All can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so um, this is part two of the IMDG code book. So it will begin with you trying uh, with um, uh, the understanding of uh, the shipper's responsibility related to uh, identifying and classifying dangerous goods, uh, a little bit on looking for, at, uh, for a short while at how the safety data sheet looks like, because that is what the shipper uses to communicate the hazards and methods to safely handle their goods in transport. And then we look at the, the classification system. So which means we will look at the nine classes of dangerous goods here with some examples and some understandings of these uh, nine class systems and certain um, domestic uh, rules and regulations when we have to move these classes of dangerous goods. So the part two of the IMDG code book will start with this first. It will talk about the responsibility for classification and it will cite um, uh, the um, uh, orange book, the UN recommendations on the transportation of dangerous goods, because that is where the classification, identification, listing, and labeling of dangerous goods uh, started from. So here the reference will be made uh, to the UN regulations as well as the global harmonized system. So for the UN regulations, which are the transport regulations for dangerous goods, we call the book the orange book, quite obviously. The book does look orange. And uh, the global harmonized system, is uh, known as the purple book. Uh, it doesn't look all that purple here, but it is a purple book. So this is the guidelines for uh, workers and for consumers. This is for transport. So once um, the manufacturer has gotten their substances tested and identified and classified, because once they tested, we went through the physical, um, where there, where's the, People trying to get into the room. So yeah, once you have tested um, the substances in the lab, based on what we ran through the physical and chemical uh, characteristics uh, of dangerous goods, they will then communicate this information in what is known as a safety data sheet. Um, the safety data sheet has got 16 uh, sections. The idea of the global harmonized system uh, by virtue of what it's called, global harmonized system. That means they want to have a system that is harmonized around the globe. So the idea is everybody communicates, every manufacturer who manufactures and transport these kind of substances that are hazardous, that are dangerous, they have to produce what is called a safety data sheet that has this 16 obligatory sections that you cannot interchange. You have to fo follow them chronologically and you have to communicate them in your national language and in English. So the 16 sections begin with who the manufacturer is and we'll run through these 16 sections when we come to part five, uh, consignment procedures. I have one slot for um, safety data sheet as well. So we'll cover that there. And then we will look at these columns and areas more in more uh, detail. So from here, I will take you to the process this is the process that is involved when they do, when a lab tech is doing the classification and identification of a substance. That means to determine what kind of hazards does the substance demonstrate. So uh, what they will do based on the physical properties of the chemicals, they will run a couple of tests depending on whether it's a liquid, solid or, or a gas. So the relevant tests will be applied on those. And based on these tests, they will, uh, I want to just change my camera angle so I can use uh, the wider camera and uh, show you, wait, I just want to make sure that you are able to see my whiteboard. So I got to take a look at my own face in the camera. All right, so I'm gonna move this and we have the whiteboard. Right, move the camera for a bit. Yeah, okay. So when a lab tech um, is testing out 
a substance to see uh, what kind of hazards because these are the hazards that are communicated in nine classes okay the nine class system so what they are testing is they will look at when they um, run a, a test on the on the sample what is the first hazard the sample demonstrates if the sample uh, explodes that means the minute they introduce heat to it and the characteristics is the minute it uh, heat is introduced it it explodes that means there is a sound there you can see it there is heat and there's pressure because these are the characteristics of something that is explosive so it fulfills these characteristics then what happens then it gets assigned to a hazard class so it falls under the hazard class one all right now assuming it's a liquid and the characteristics of this liquid are such that this liquid um, changes its form at um, 40 degrees celsius so how do they know that they apply the closed and the op open cup test so they put the liquid into a cup and then they close it up and then they introduce heat and they will have a temperature gauge to see at what temperature just that does that liquid turn into a gas so assuming that liquid turns into a gas at say 30 degrees celsius so which means that that now became a class three because it has demonstrated that it is a flammable liquid but what now is that the liquid when it turns into gas that flammable gas is also has additional hazards to it that means not only is it flammable but if you were exposed to this gas chances are your skin will start burning right so if it demonstrate a hazard like that that means not only if i uh, if uh, the if the liquid turns into a gas and i light a fire and that gas catches fire flammable gas but if i by any chance go close to that gas suddenly i feel itchiness like my skin is drying and itching up and it irritation so which means that this liquid probably has some this product has got some corrosive properties also in it so which means that it also has a sub see dairy risk or hazard cannot use the word risk huh? hazard 3918 right so a substance can have purely one hazard which is class one that means it tested it exploded and pop that was it after it exploded that was all that happened to it it did not become anything more from that but there are also some substances that when it gets caught into a chemical reaction it demonstrates the first reaction the first reaction is what is the main hazard that means in between these two like for instance if we take this um, flammable liquid and it turns into a flammable gas for instance okay and it also has corrosiveness so in between these two also they will look they will see is this the higher ha hazard that means when it turns into gas and it catches fire and that's the bigger hazard or that it is so strong in its corrosiveness that the minute it is introduced in a certain number of uh, period like uh, four hours or what you have full skin destruction so what will happen is then the main hazard will actually be corrosive it will not even be a flammable liquid it'll be a corrosive liquid with a sub hazard as a flammable liquid do you get what i mean so whenever they test these substances in the lab what is communicated is what is the most hazardous so not necessarily what is first manifested because if you test it and it first manifests like oh it changes its form into a flammable gas right so you will say oh that must be the primary hazard because that's what first manifests when i test this thing but then while you're testing and it manifested into a gas and yes it appears to be a flammable gas but hey wait a minute in this few hours that i was in the lab i have come my skin has been totally damaged and broken so which means that this is now more potent in its corrosiveness so they will look at in a substance what is the most hazardous um, result of what takes place in its chain reaction when it's tested in the lab that will be communicated as the primary hazard and if that substance has 
demonstrates more than one hazard, the others will be known as subsidiary hazards. So first thing they do is they look for this. They find the hazards first. And based on the hazards that they test in the lab, then comes the numbering. La. That means which number, which number. Because the class system is communicating a bunch of hazards. That's all it's doing. It's not giving you a level that nombo satu means paling dangerous, nombo sembilan means, or nombo lapan, least dangerous. That's not what it's doing. It's just that it's using a bunch of numbering systems to communicate various kind of hazards that are results of a chemical reaction when these substances are transported and handled because of pressure and temperature, the two main elements that change the nature of these substances. Okay, so once they have found that out, then the next thing they do is they go to find the proper shipping name of the substance. Because once they have determined the hazard, they need to know what to now list it as. What is the name that I have to use? Because a proper shipping name, by virtue of the word shipping, now in English, you would take shipping to mean like in general sense, you will say, oh, ship means by ship right, by seawater, by ship. But that's the thing about English language, la, very irritating sometimes. Shipping can mean anything. It can be road, rail, air, sea, anything, right? The word shipping means it's going for a transport, for a movement. So when they use the word proper shipping name, that means it's a name that has been given to a product or a substance that is harmonious, globally recognized around the world. And it's usually a technical name of the substance. And when we come to part three, we will talk about how these PSNs are arranged. That means how do they organize? Where does what go? Because you will be introduced to something called generic names, you know, NOS, not otherwise specified. And you need to understand these kind of things. Yeah. So when they have to go and check for the PSNs, what they do is in the second volume of the IMDG code, volume two, which is part three of the IMDG code, when you get your hands on the, on the code book, right at the back of the code book because when you look at the code book you see uh, this is my camera uh, you see that this is all the dgls you see that but when you go at the back and you open up you get these da, 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 da. this is the index so what they do now is they go through these index to find the name, because there could be that their substance, if it is not a mixture, it's a pure substance. It's a substance that has been transported for a very long time. Then they will get the name there quite clearly. But if the substance is a mixture, they've mixed so many things in it that they can't find its name. I will now, I will then talk to you about how they get that name when we come to part three. All right, when we come to PSNs. Okay, so. They test the hazards to identify. Please put your mic on, uh, the rest of you. If you, uh, Nanmuli, turn off your mic, yeah? Only on your mic when I say open for questions. Okay, because it disturbs everybody else in the class. Okay, so they, they find the hazard. What is the primary hazard? Whether that substance has a subsidiary hazard. Then they go to the index to find the name of the substance. Once they go to the index and they find the name of the substance, the index itself at the end of it here, will identify the UN number for the substance. Then with the UN number, they will go here to the DGL to find out the hazard class, la, the blah, 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 the name, la, the characteristics, la, all that information. Well, then they will take them to there. All right. Also, when they are doing that, when they have found the PSN has, while they are testing the substance, when they are doing the whether um, what whether it has um, a subsidiary hazard or not, they are also testing for these other two things, which is is the substance a marine pollutant, right? And um, how do they determine determine that? There is a test that indicates how quickly the substance goes into water, and how whether it remains on top of the water and blocks sunlight and oxygen. And when it does, assuming it's miscible or it, 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 it's, so it goes into water, it's soluble or it's miscible, it goes down to the bed of the, uh, the seabed, does it start accumulating there or does it, is it soluble or is it still in its solid form? 
And when it is collected at the bottom there, does it start degrading that environment? So if it does all of those things, then definitely it's a marine pollutant. So they will identify, okay, this one's a marine pollutant or an environment pollutant. Then goes packing group. So packing group also, I will explain to you when we come to part three, then I'll explain packing group. So now this moves us to the classes. Okay, so now when we move to the classes, I am going to move my camera back to my notebook camera. Okay, so the, when you learn classification, you are not just learning the nine class systems. You must first understand one thing, that the way they have arranged this, the number one right up to the number nine that you see on your screen, they have not arranged this in ranking. That means number one doesn't constitute the most dangerous class, although it is one of the most dangerous classes. However, in terms of all the nine class labels that you see here, the one that is the most dangerous is the class seven. Because this is a class where you cannot smell, you cannot see, you cannot feel, you don't really know when you are in, um, in an area where the area is radiated or there's any radiation going on right there. So that makes it really very dangerous. And which means that moving this thing, IMDG code will not be sufficient. You have to go for further training. In fact, I myself am reg have registered for RPO training in this area because I need to know more as well. And that same applies for class one as well. Because in the entire nine class systems, class one and class seven, class seven especially, just like we have IMO, International Maritime Organization for Sea Transport, we have um, ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization for Air Transport. For uh, nuclear radioactive materials, there is an international agency known as the International Atomic Energy Agency. So everything related to the transportation of radioactive or nuclear products, you have to follow the international guidelines under IAEA. And in Malaysia, you have to work with our agency, which is known as AELB, Atomic Energy Licensing Board. So when you learn the class systems, you need to know the colors of uh, the symbols, the transport symbols that represent class. So these are your labels here. And you have to know what each of them mean. Like for instance, if you look at the class 2.1 label and you look at the class 3 label, they look exactly the same as each other with the difference where one shows a 2 and the other shows a 3. And they are both, like everything that has a full red would tell you that it's flammable. Everything that uh, you see with this there is some kind of oxidizer, some kind of thing in there. And then these are the other hazards, right? Whenever you see skull and bones, you know that it is some poison, like it's toxic, either it's in a gas form or it's in a solid or a liquid form. Yeah, so when you know the classes, it's knowing the class. So when you mention class two, you are not being specific when I ask you, okay, what kind of classes are you familiar with? And you say class two, that's not sufficient what, 2.1 or 2.2 or 2.3. So for classes that have their subdivisions, you must mention their subdivisions. For classes that do not have subdivisions, like class three, class seven, class eight, class nine. Now these classes, they are straightforward, clear cut. That means they do not have their own subdivisions within them. And then you will also notice that some classes have packing groups and some classes do not have packing groups. Class one does not have, class two does not have, class seven does not have. We'll come to that when we come to part three of this code. Yeah, so here I will again run through packing group when I come to class three and class eight to explain how this concept has come in, because before we came to this slideshow, I told you to think about this, that kerosene and petrol, both of these substances fall under class three. That means both are flammable liquids. But obviously you and I know that one is more dangerous than the other. However, since both of them fall under the same class, how do we communicate to everyone that one is more dangerous than the other? And the method in doing that is applying this concept, the packing group concept. 
This packing group concept is how a class three is communicated to identify what, whether the petrol is more dangerous or the kerosene is more dangerous. And what they do is they use PG1, which, in, which communicates high danger, PG2 communicates medium danger, and PG3, which communicates low danger. All right? So when we come to three, I will show you that. So this is the UN number, yeah? The, oh, I think I'm running the part three with you guys, not part two. Just give me a sec. Uh. Oh, no, it's, it is part two. I should cover this in part three to give you more information on the UN and PSN. So I will cover this later. I don't want to confuse you right now, okay? So we go straight to the classes. <laughs> Class one is uh, explosive, and this explosives they like when you when you when you uh, when a substance falls under a class one, you can't group it under one because this class one of explosives there are six subdivisions to them, so which means that. Whenever a substance falls under this class grouping, it cannot be just class one. It has to be a class one subdivision what? That means which subdivision it falls under. So let's look at, let's look at the subdivisions, yeah? So let's start with 1.1. Um, now 1.1 are the kind of substances that have a mass explosion hazard. Now when you see a mass explosion hazard, it means that, now I think I have to check it again, change the camera, because I want to show you the whiteboard. Okay, there you go. When a explosive substance falls under division 1.1, that explosive substance is known as a mass explosion hazard. Now it is known as a mass explosion hazard because the quantity that is filled in the receptacle of this explosive substance and the packaging that is used for this explosive substance is such that when heat or fire is introduced to it, it will react in such a way that it will have a massive explosion. The example they gave us here is gunpowder because you will notice this gunpowder will also be something that will be used for another class, example, class uh, 1.4, subdivision 1.4. So why does gunpowder in 1.4, why is it known as no significant hazard, where in 1.1, it is known as a mass explosion hazard? Because when it comes to packaging, you need to understand one thing. In packaging, you have three categories. One is known as single type, the other one is known as combination type of package. And the third type is known as composite package. Composite. A single package is a drum. Yeah, you put the product into the drum. You don't put a drum into a carton box. Can You take the drum and then you pack it into a container. So it's a single type of packaging. A combination type of packaging is if, for instance, you are filling, the product is filled into bottles. So when you fill something in a plastic bottle or a glass bottle, you cannot, you will not be taking one by one bottle and packing it into a container. Finish la, you know, that's it. Your, you will, your, your productivity will be terrible. What generally happens is the bottle is put into a carton box. So the product is filled in the bottle. The bottle, like say my bottle, this bottle is an inner package. The water is the product. That means inside here is a dangerous goods. Then this inner package, I put it inside a carton box. The carton box is the outer package. So what is a combination package? A combination, is a, a combination package is one that has an inner and an outer. A composite package is the type of package where, if you can imagine the olden days punya flask, where inside there is like a glass inner. You open, it's to keep your product, your, your drink hot. But you can see the glass thing, you can hear it.
and you move it a little bit, but you cannot remove the inner out of the outer shell. That is called composite type packaging. So the 1.1 division is a gunpowder filled into a single type packaging because when you look at a drum can take up to about 200 kgs. So you light a match to a drum holding 200 kgs of gunpowder. And of course, what do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna massively explode. Now 1.2 is a kind of an explosive where this kind of explosive, in order for it to detonate, that means in order for it to explode, it needs some kind of power propulsion that will, that will use force, push it using force, push it somewhere, and the, the force that pushes it would be what would break it and make it detonate. That means that would then render it explosive. So examples here are like rockets and missiles. They fall under the 1.2. 1.3 are substances and articles that have a fire hazard and either a minor blast hazard or a minor projection hazard. So this is like, uh, you know, incendiary uh, ammunition, bullets, you know, they have a minor explosion, very tiny, and a minor um, uh, projection because you still need propulsion to pull the trigger so the bullet can be fired, right? So that's your 1.3. Now, 1.4 are explosives that have no significant hazard. No significant hazard. So whenever people hear the word no significant hazard, they have a tendency of thinking the thing is not hazardous. No, it is hazardous, but it is not significant like a 1.1. An example given here, if you can see the picture is this. This is a marjon, a firecrackers. Now, when you look at firecrackers or fireworks like these, it is actually gunpowder, right? And a bunch of other chemicals mixed to make the array of colors that you see that appear. But actually the active ingredient is some kind of a gunpowder. Gun so this thing though, now you see gunpowder, but it falls under a category known as not significantly dangerous or not, sig not a significant hazard. Why? Because it has combination packaging. The gunpowder is in the tiny, uh, this tiny receptacle where they put uh, for the firecracker, then that thing is packed inside this packaging. And this packaging is then put into a carton box. So actually there is an intermediate packaging and then an outer packaging involved. So because the quantity is lesser and you have multiple layers of packaging here, it falls under substances and articles that present no significant hazard. Now, 1.5 is a substance that is considered to be insensitive. So when something is known to be insensitive means it is not sensitive, okay? It's not about it being sensitive. It is not sensitive. So this substance is not sensitive. That means it won't easily uh, explode. But once you trigger it, that means you initiate it, then this one will explode like massive, like what happened to... I, because this is this example here is C4, and in order to get people to remember this, I remind them of Altantuya. Uh, that's what they used on her. The case is not close, right? So we'll talk about this constantly when we have the classes. So we'll say that this was the product that that uh, put her down ultimately. Yeah, C4. It's used for demolition of buildings and mining purposes and whatnot. Then you have the 1.6. These are extremely insensitive articles that do not have a mass projection hazard or mass explosion hazard. Um, so they don't initiate easily. That means if you, they won't suddenly explode. And when they explode also, they don't have a massive explosion. So this is very, 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 very not sensitive. That means very strong for Lala. It's not going to easily explode. Now, these subdivisions, you notice there are six subdivisions for class one, but you would assume six subdivisions of class one. If I had a 1.4 package and I had a 1.2 package, can I pack them together? I'll put them in the same box. They're both the class one cargoes. They should be able to be together, right? They're all explosives, right? But that's not the case. Now with class one, this is the only class in the nine class systems that have something called compatibility groups here. You take a look at it in the next slide. So these are the compatibility groups. 
And the compatibility groups are generally what would guide you on how, whether you can put one subdivision with the other. That means you cannot put a 1.3 with a 1.5 or a 1.2 with a 1.4 unless they share this alphabet, these compatibility groups together, right? So this is the only class that has a compatibility group. This is a class that does not have the packing group concepts because packing group, yes, does relate to packages, but it relates to package because package is the noun and packing is the verb. It relates to packages in that, in the sense that how much can you pack into them? Uh, so why is packing group not used for class one? Because class one has got their own specific type of packaging. And we will learn about that when we come to part four of the code book, how this differentiates itself from the common packaging that a class three or the ones that have packing group utilize, okay? Another thing to note, whenever a class one cargo is imported, exported, moved anywhere in our country, this cargo needs to have police permit. That means you have to apply for police permit. It needs to be uh, uh, accompanied with them, right? And um, this cargo, you need to get permission even for the ship to dock at the port to unload for direct discharge and direct, direct delivery. In, Mal in Malaysia, you have to be an MTO in order to handle any um, explosive uh, cargoes. All right, so that moves us now to uh, class two. So class two is the class uh, that is for the group of gases. Because if you think of it, right, first you think about how gases move. How do we transport gases? Um, there's no way to transport it. Like, like I like the gas in this room and I say, oh, I want to transport this gas. I can only do that if I apply pressure. And when I apply pressure to this, at a certain temperature, the gas will liquefy. When it does liquefy, then that is the only form for me to transport it or, or to pressurize it. That means apply pressure to contain and move the gas. So gases are moved or transported in these forms, either in compressed form uh, or in liquefied form. So even in, and all of it has to do with what is known as the critical uh, temperature level of these gases. Okay, so the critical temperature level of gases is the temperature at which, like we saw, flash point is the temperature at which the liquid becomes a gas. Now, critical temperature of gases is the temperature at which, when you apply pressure, the gas turns into a liquid. All right. So, um, compressed gases have a critical temperature of negative 50 degrees Celsius. That means only at negative 50 degrees Celsius and below will these gases turn into liquid, like oxygen, carbon dioxide. So, usually these go into uh, major compression chambers. Then you have those that fall under liquefied gases. So these are the ones between 65 degrees Celsius and negative uh, 50 degrees Celsius. Those are the high pressure liquefied gases. And the ones that are under the low pressure liquefied gases, those are the ones that are above 65 degrees Celsius. But also we have gases that are refrigerated. We have gases that are dissolved into solvent phase. And we also have gases that are dissolved into porous um, into a solid uh, phase. But the gases that you need to learn when it comes to dangerous goods classes are three defined classes. Gases would either be in class 2.1. Now, if, it, if a gas falls under the class 2.1, these are gases that are known to be flammable gases, like um, hydrogen, like liquid petroleum gas, right? Or nitrogen gas. 2.2, uh, are for non-flammable gases or non-toxic gases like um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, uh, or even the gases that the cooling gases uh, that they use uh, for the air condition. Now, these are all non-toxic. They're not going to kill you. They're non-flammable, and they usually have very, very low uh, critical temperatures. So they will go. Uh, they usually travel in compressed form. Two point three are toxic gases. So these are gases that when you're exposed to them at a certain point, there's a limit, a control limit. At a certain point, we calculate them in particles per million. At a certain point, this can put you down. You can suffocate and die if you're exposed to these kind of gases like 
chlorine is one of them. Here they've given you bromine chloride as well. Now, gases also, the concept of packing group doesn't apply here because gases have their own type of packaging. So the packing group concept doesn't come in here. But the packing group comes here from now on, from the class three onwards. So class three are flow flammable liquids. And I mentioned to you that uh, I gave you two examples saying that kerosene and petrol, both of them fall under class three. Both are concerned uh, or known as uh, flammable liquids. But obviously one is more dangerous than the other. And that is petrol. Why is petrol more dangerous? Now, even if I talk about all these fancy words like flashpoint, I will do something very simple and ask you, when you go to fill petrol in your car, in the petrol kiosk, you use a, long, a nozzle that has a very long nose, right? And you stick it into your car petrol tank and you're filling petrol. On a hot day, you will notice this see-through colorless fumes uh, escaping from the out of your petrol tank there. Now, that already tells you that this, even while you're filling petrol, it's vaporizing while you're filling. So when it's coming out of that machine, uh, the pump into your car, it's, you are, you are, it's calculating what's coming out though, but what's going in is much lesser than what's coming out, if you understand what I mean, because it's vaporizing during the process of filling into your car. That's why I always tell people, fill your car during night, malam, malam, fill petrol, because it's cooler and you won't lose, right? But the point I'm trying to make is because of petrol's flash point. The flash point is so low, it's a negative 20 something degrees. It is so low that even though you have this long nozzle and all that, still you see the vaporization taking place. But kerosene, you take minyatana, you open the bottle, how long also you won't see any vapor come out. You have to literally take the flame and stick it right at the kerosene for it to catch fire. But petrol, you don't need to do that. You're filling petrol, your handphone call comes in, there's a static charge, boom! You've seen enough Facebook videos to know. So how does packing group come here now? So packing group is now coming in to explain exactly this, to communicate to everyone that when a class tree is moving, when the class tree falls under PG1, high danger, what does that mean? That means that any flammable liquid that falls under this high danger type of category has a flash point of below zero degrees Celsius. That means already negatives. La. So anything that is that has a flash point, that means at that tahap suhu, it changes from a liquid to a gas. Here they're saying below zero degrees. All right, that is really scary. So that's our petrol. This is where it sits. Okay. Then they say anything that falls under PG2, which is considered medium danger. So for medium danger, the flammable liquid range falls under 0 to 23 degrees Celsius. Here, look at this, 0 to 23 Celsius. So what comes here, like the oil paints and these kind of things. So they don't vaporize that easily. They have a range. I mean, 23 degrees is still pretty low, mind you, okay? Like, Outside, the temperature is very hot. So these kind of things will start vaporizing and forming inflammable gases, which means anything can initiate it, even friction. Yeah? And then those that fall under PG3 are the ones that have flash points, because this is known as minor danger, 23 degrees to 60 degrees Celsius. So that will communicate in a flammable liquid, looking at the packing group. Because what the packing group is telling you, yeah, it's telling you high danger, medium danger, minor danger, but what? What, what, do, you, what do you mean? Danger, danger, danger. People like to use the word danger. Quantify this danger to me. So the quantifying of the danger is the flashpoint. Anything that has a flashpoint of zero degrees and below, it's extremely dangerous, my friends. It will vaporize as our petrol does when we're filling the tank. Anything that is zero to 23 degrees is also dangerous because if we take that stuff outside of our, if, our, if we don't have the ACs on and it's hot and our room ambient temperature is 30 degrees, this thing is going to vaporize and form into a flammable gas. Pom again, it will catch fire. And then PG3, 
still a flammable gas, but it ranges, you see the temperature is higher a bit. So it is a danger, but it's considered a minor danger. So this is where kerosene, diesel, those kind of things fall under. So when we communicate, because we have to understand when we talk about dangerous goods, what we're actually talking about is this, right? Risk, risk. Yeah, hazard, hazard. Hazard, you are looking at hazard to the environment, hazard to the people. When I talk about risk, I'm talking about dollars and cents, money, 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 insurance. Every cargo is insured. It has to be insured because somebody else is taking the cargo on behalf of the shipper. If the shipper doesn't insure their cargo, buy cargo insurance, good luck, luck, because you are open to anything that can possibly happen to you. And the service provider, the forwarding agent, the freight forwarder, whoever is involved in the third party transport and movement and handling of the cargo. You also need insurance. You need to buy insurance because you're liable the minute you accept this cargo, whatever it represents, you now become liable to it. So a shipping line is liable. A shipping line is carrying everybody's cargo together with say some your cargo. So the shipping line is liable to your cargo, which is dangerous and everybody else's cargo who might not be dangerous. And if your cargo is not packed properly and it misbehaves and it causes an explosion on the ship and then it affects everybody else's cargo, it's going to be a massive disaster, right or not? Especially if you have loss of lives in this situation. So whenever we have liability coverage, like a shipping light, a freight forwarder, what is very important is communicating the highest hazard, the most hazardous. If you fail to communicate the most hazardous, you are actually um, retaining information, which is actually a breach of contract because you are in contract with them. So there's like so many implications in law as well. So when we're learning dangerous goods, yeah, there are your concern about hazards, uh, the environment, but there are so many things that you have to be concerned with. Risk, money, law, legality, everything. Yeah, and that is why we need to communicate these hazards because whoever is going to undertake, imagine you, you, somebody asks, your neighbor asks you to help out to take care of their pet. And their pet happens to be a cobra. All right. Isn't it risky? The cobra could come and strike you, right? Obviously, you would want to know whether the cobra has removed the venom from it or de-venomed it or whatever, so that you can, if you agree to take care of it, that you would take care of it. So similarly, when you are giving something to somebody else and the manufacturer is taking their very hazardous goods and giving it to somebody else to handle and move for them, they must communicate the hazards and they must communicate the highest hazard to whoever is going to undertake the liability, the care, custody and control of the cargo to move it on behalf of them. All right. So that's where packing group comes in. Because then again, I said, you hear the word packing. Packing is a doing word a verb, all right? It's not a package. But this packing group has a connection to the package because it will tell you how much you can pack into the package and it will also tell you how stringent the performance test must be for a package that falls or that is intended for a product under a specific packing group, okay? So that is three. And three, we as, there is another area with, which, comes, uh, which comes in pertaining to viscosity, but I will leave it for function specific. Okay? We will come, cover that in the FS level. In the GA level, you must know the class numbers, the subdivisions, and the hazard symbols, and the names of these hazards, and the concept of packing group. That means how is packing group coming here to define these things. So this is for class four, which is flammable solids. So class four also, when you are referring to classes that have subdivisions, you can never refer to the family name. That means you cannot say class two, uh, class two gases, right? You have to be either 2.1, 2.2 or 2.3. So same goes for the class four. You cannot base on it on um, the group of uh, uh, substance. Like you can't say, oh, class four is for flammable solids. You cannot. You have to be specific. What is 4.1? Because class four has got three subdivisions. And this is 
the class that is specifically for substances that are in solid form and that are construed as flammable. So they have broken the flammability of this kind of solid substance into three different levels. There's a 4.1, there's a 4.2, and there's a 4.3. So the 4.1 first, that is a flammable solid, and it falls under the readily combustible. All right? So that's another word that we need to now get ourselves acquainted with. What does combustible mean? What is flammable? What is combustible? Flammable, we already know. We define the flammable liquid with regards to flashpoint. Now we come to combustible. Because when we come to solids, we want to know how quickly does this thing catch fire and how intensely does it burn. Let's take a household example. You imagine you've got a, a candle in front of you, a lit candle in front of you. One hand, you have the aluminum foil, you know, the one they use to wrap the food to keep it hot. And in your other hand, you have a normal A4 paper or newspaper, it doesn't matter, but normal paper. And you take both of this and you introduce it to the fire, the flame. Which will catch fire first? Obviously, the paper will catch fire. The aluminum foil, you have to keep it for a little while longer into the fire, then only the fellow will catch fire. But now that I introduced both of them in the fire to see who caught fire first was the normal paper, I'm going to pull them away from the fire and see who remains burning longer. You will notice that the normal paper, even when you take it out of the flame, the fellow is still catching and burning and burning, burning. But the aluminum foil, after a while, when it has actually caught fire and you pull it out of the flame, it stops burning. Right? So... That would talk about combustibility between, that will explain to you what combustibility means. Combustibility means how quickly something catches fire and how intensely or how long it continues burning. So the packing groups for these substances work on that. How quickly it burns and how intensely it burns. So when we come to 4.1, we're talking about those that will immediately catch fire. That's why it's called readily combustible. So these are like metal powders. They've given you examples, uh, fibers, powdered, granular, pasty substances, which are dangerous if they can be easily ignited. And if the flame spreads rapidly uh, by brief contract with the ignition source, such as a burning match, and if the flame spreads uh, rapidly. The danger may come not only from the fire, but also from toxic combustion of products. Metal powders are especially dangerous because of the difficulty in extinguishing them. Now, metals have an uh, oxides, so which means oxygen. And oxygen is something that is known as a catalyst to fire because um, uh, it makes the fire burn more intensely, like your gas stove, when you turn on the fire, and if the fire is yellow, that means there's a lot of carbon, uh, not enough oxygen. So that's why it's yellow, it's not hot. But when it's completely blue, there's a lot of oxygen being pumped and that flame is extremely hot. So oxygen is actually an accelerator. It will really make things burn. And a lot of these metal powders have oxygen components in them. So when these catch fire, you cannot use water. If you use water, you are actually going to make the fire burn even more intensely because water is H2O, right? You still have an oxygen component in there. So um, that is why it is important to know uh, how to address, in a sense, for these kind of substances, how do you address them in the case of a fire? So here they tell you the assignation of uh, packing groups. For readily combustible solids other than metal powders, the PG2 shall be assigned if the burning time is less than 45 seconds and the flame passes the wetted, wetted zone. So it's how quickly and how intensely, how far does it continue burning. So that's what they're talking about here. And also in 4.1, under readily combustible, you get these type of substances that are known as self-reactive substances. They are thermally unstable, which means, so th this kind of fellow, this one doesn't even have a packing group because there's a specialized packaging that you use for this kind of cargo. Suddenly, this cargo will pop, 
start initiation. It'll start decomposition, start burning and producing heat and stuff. And it could happen even if you place it next to certain things. Uh, so like they say here, the decomposition of a self-reactive substance can be initiated by heat, contact with uh, catalytic impurities such as acids or heavy metal compounds or bases, you know, uh, alkalines, friction or impact. Some even with oil, you keep them with uh, stuff like oil or, or certain things, it will start reaction already. So these substances don't have packing groups because they have their special um, type of packaging. Uh, we'll see that when we come into part four. And um, they are very, very, they're like, you have these kind of people who are thermally unstable. I'm pretty sure you know people of such, you know, they're good mood today, bipolar, right? And um, also you have these types under 4.1. These are solid desensitized explosives. So these are actually explosive products. They've come under the flammable solids because these explosive products, they have desensitized it. They have rendered, they have reduced its explosive, uh, explos explosiveness by diluting it in uh, water or alcohol and something, right? So only when it's in dried state, that means if they remove the water or alcohol, is it explosive? So they have desensitized it. It's still a flammable solid, mind you. That means it has not met the stuff, not dangerous. It's still dangerous, but it's not explosive. That's all. And this is something new. I mean, this came in in 3816, where um, there was one product that they tested out in the lab and they thought the hazard for that substance was that it had a low flash point. So they put it under class three. But during transit, they found out that actually that was not the case, that this product was uh, producing hydro, uh, hydrogen gas. It was producing gas. It was heating up. And from that gas and production, you know, the heat generation that was taking place, actually what was happening was the substances were polymerizing. That means like what they make for plastic. Plastic is in monomer form. Then to make it into the plastic that we use, it goes through a process called polymerization. So they, with the process of polymerization is very dangerous. There's heat, there are gases that are released. And you don't want them to take place when people are trying to move the cargo during transport and handling. So for these kind of substance, they also fall under the 4.1, but they are known as polymerizing substances. And when these things are moved in uh, IBC or in a tank, they want to know what, how much stabilizer has been used because these are also uh, unstable substances. That means due in, in the transit due to changes in temperature, it will start heating up and decomposing. So there must be some kind of stabilizer added into this to keep it stable during transit. So in the tech sheet, they will want to know what, how much stabilizer has been used to keep this product stable and what is the uh, specific, um, uh, the temperature, you know, specific uh, uh, accelerating polymerizing temperature. There, cell, or the self, sorry, not specific, self accelerating polymerizing temperature. 4.2 are for flammable solids that are spontaneously combustible. So 4.1 were the readily combustible. That means they just immediately start catching fire. Whereas the 4.2 spontaneously means this one takes their time. So there are two categories here. One is known as pyrophoric. That means when it comes into air, within five minutes, it will catch fire. I'm making a lot of weird sounds, but you know, it's to keep your attention with me and it makes it interesting. Now, many, if any of you have Netflix and have you ever watched Breaking Bad, I would recommend watching it. Not so you can start a math lab, but there's a lot of chemistry you can learn from there. And you can actually see that he actually uses this uh, uh, yellow phosphorus to, he releases it and then it becomes like a, a smoke in the air, a big, huge cloud of smoke and he escapes from the cops. So it's interesting how he uses chemistry because he's a chemistry teacher to run his meth lab. Anyway, it's fun, interesting way to learn to love chemistry. Uh, the other type of 4.2 spontaneously combustible solid is the self-heating types like cotton, like charcoal, um, like um, palm kernel seeds. We produce a lot of that. We produce palm oil, so we remove the oil out of the palm fruit and then the seed 
uh, they will use hexane and sort of uh, agents to kind of remove all derivatives, whatever, out of it and dry it up. And then they make it into flakes or pellets and they use this as animal feed. So these things are very dry. And if they're not compacted, because you need it to be properly compacted, if they're not compacted, you have oxygen going in and out of them. And what happens is because they're so dry and oxygen moves around in them, and remember oxygen is the naughty guy, moves around in them and direct heat or sunlight, over time what will happen, you will see smoke billowing out of it. So these kind of substances, in fact, there are special provisions when it comes to these kind of products when they are dangerous, in the dangerous goods uh, UN numbers. There's a special provision that will define whether the stuff is dangerous or not, depending on how it has been packed. It means how densely it has been packed together. Then 4.3 are flammable solids. These are the solids that react when, when water touches them. So uh, we like to call them flammable solids that are dangerous when wet, but it has a long definition. And if you're working towards going for your CPC exam with LPK, you have to learn the long definition, which is flammable solids when in contact with water emit flammable gases. So a clear example of this is calcium carbide or uh, we all know uh, it as Miriam Kampong. Okay, so this thing, uh, we produce a lot of it. Calcium carbide comes a lot from Para. We have a lot of lime hills. They treat the lime hills to get calcium carbide, to treat it and to make calcium carbide. And uh, when water hits calcium carbide, what happens is it uh, evolves. That means it goes through a chemical reaction and it changes from solid to gas form. And the, form, the gas that it forms is acetylene gas, which is a flammable gas, mind you. So we've had so many accidents already because um, I know I've been training DG now, let's say almost 10 years, yeah, almost, yeah. And around the country, yeah, East Malaysia, I think you all know, for those who know, you all know, you follow on Facebook and you know that uh, we train virtually everywhere in the country. We train ports, terminals, manufacturers, surveyors, shippers, you name it. So everyone involved in dangerous goods. And we know for a fact, and I know for a fact, that there are some manufacturers when they ship out calcium carbide internationally, they declare it as DG. But when they send it to East Malaysia, they don't declare it as DG. And that is so wrong. And the the reasons that are given is pathetically lame. They say something like, because the buyer doesn't want to buy the product because of the surcharge of the DG. Now you cannot do that. Accidents can happen and it is socially irresponsible, bottom line. So because people are so scared of losing their jobs, uh, what to do? Anyways, that's a story of a different day. We will talk about it if I don't have to share it on social media and social platform knows I might get sued. So scary. I'm not going to talk about it and mention names now. But be wary of uh, 4.3. Now we move to 5.1. So we've come to 5.1. 5.1 and 5.2 are substances that have a little bit extra oxygen component in it. And they are considered to be extremely dangerous. So like um, these substances on their own, they won't catch fire. And uh, they, but what happens is if they are placed next to something that is on fire, what it'll do, it will, the oxygen content in it will contribute to the fire that is next to it and make the thing burn even more intensely. All right. So 5.1, as you can see here, example, ammonium nitrate uh, for, uh, based fertilizers. Uh, these are the things that even we control because we produce this stuff and we control it and it's under a strategic trade act because it's also one of the famous items that terrorists love to get their hands on it makes good bombs and these substances yeah mixtures of oxidizing substances with combustible materials so anything that like oil or sugar or edible oils or mineral oils all this if you keep it next next to a oxidizing substance the reaction will start these mixtures are readily ignited in some cases by friction or impact and they burn violently and may lead to explosion violent reactions between 5.1 and acids they evolve into toxic gases and these toxic gases in certain cases may evolve again into a fire all right 5.2 
organic peroxides, very, very thermally unstable. These substances move also, you have to indicate what is known as the self-accelerating decomposition temperature because at certain temperatures, this thing starts decomposing and it starts producing heat. So there are special tanks that we carry this cargo in. And when they're carried in like IBCs and otherwise, then you, there are special packaging for it and the amount of stabilizer is very important. And when it travels by tank, of course, you have to give the control temperatures for this substance, yeah? 5.2 organic peroxides. 6.1 are uh, toxic substances. A lot of this stuff is now um, being shipped around the world. I mean, thanks to the virus, right? So a lot of our insecticides, pesticides, herbicide, all the side side all the side sides all come from these kind of products. So these are the products that are mixed, um, like the gas 2.3 chlorine gas. Chlorine gas is actually uh, mixed into our water so that to chlorinate our water to kill the germs, pathogens, so that we, the water is safe for us to drink. Similarly, these kind of things like arsenics, pesticides and all that, a lot of it um, is now moving and we produce a large amount, that means a fairly large amount, Malaysia also exports of these products. So here the packing groups are divided based on its toxicity. They will look, that there are these two um, identifiers for toxicity in either toxic gases or toxic substances. So for 2.3, the focus will be on LC, lethal con concentration levels. And for 6.1, it will be based on LD, which is um, uh, lethal dosage levels. That means if you ingest this thing, um, they will tell you uh, how lethal is the dose. And based on that, it, the packing groups will be identified. They do these tests on lab rats and all that. And that's how they find out the level of toxicity in a substance. So for this, of course, we have the Poison Act and all of that. If you're a manufacturer, there are various rules and regulations related to this. And uh, 6.2, of course, is uh, for infectious substances. And um, we don't move this by C, mind you. I mean, these are your like COVID-19, pandemics and all that. You don't want to put this in a long transit time. Why? Because usually long transit time, you, it's exposed to tons of risk. And then anything like this suddenly escapes its packaging. We'll have a COVID God knows when or what other virus, you know, and we all know now we're all so sick and tired of this COVID-19. I'm sure you guys are as jaded as I am of this virus. So all these things fall under 6.2. It travels by air. It doesn't travel on any other air, like normal passenger aircraft, all that. It's a very controlled item. You need to get um, uh, uh, permits and approvals whenever you move this from the Ministry of Health. Yeah? And why do people move it around for testing purposes? Like something new popped out and you don't know hey, why people are getting this crazy illness and they are manifesting in such, such ways. So they may have to send it to labs that are advanced to test out and find out what exactly is it. And that's probably what happened with COVID-19 too. Um, class seven, the most extremely dangerous class. These are for radioactive materials. So the radioactive materials, and mind you, radiation is uh, emitted by virtually anything. Even we emit radiation. When we die and they bury us in the ground, we are still emitting radiation, but there are different types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, different types. Alpha is safe, a lot of us uh, and natural stuff actually emit these levels of radiation, um, alpha and beta, okay. Gamma is the dangerous one, your x-rays and all that. So these are the ones that actually disrupt your DNA. They break the formation of your DNA or change it and radically do things that could uh, cause a lot of autoimmunity diseases and problems later in life. And those that have higher level of radiation, the fissile nucleides. These one, of course, if you're exposed to it in a matter of hours, your immune system attacks you. You look like an AIDS patient, like you've got AIDS, full-blown AIDS. So, and the thing is that about radioactive material, it's not like, you know, I can put something inside like a package and uh, it's a radioactive stuff and I can, 
you know, it's contained in, I would assume, you cannot assume when they to be like, I put the radioactive material, it's, con it's confined in the package. No, the package does to a certain degree block it because that is how you block the radiation uh, spread from the, from the package for, for emission out of a package, but still there are low levels, you know, of radiation for it. And then you cannot take out that package or container, empty that container and then pass it to somebody else to use it because it's already been radiated contaminated with radiation so it has to go through its own irradiation that means it has to go through its own cleaning before it can be used so the point i'm trying to make the most dangerous class we don't know when we are exposed to it we can't just pack it into anything we can't assume that anything that's been around it is not radiated and is not going to contaminate further so like what happened in fukushima and then yeah i'm pretty sure you know like a lot of the marine life that we are eating it's got high levels of radiation and mercury. It's all part of our food chain right now. That's why uh, people are dying very easily now. People are getting cancer so easily. It's generally that. And, you know, as much as you like seafood, you should not eat much of it. And if you do eat seafood, eat the ones with hard shells, you know, so hard to muscle dalam. But even then, try not to eat seafood. I don't really fancy it. I like, but I stay away as much as I can. Uh, bad for the fishery industry, but seriously. Uh, then we come to class eight. So class eight, now this actually, this entire chapter got changed in the IMDG code in version 39. Because prior to this, when they were doing this uh, packing groups, right, for class eight, they were looking purely on um, corrosion, on materials, property. They were not looking at this, the full destruction of skin tissue. So when, it, when the um, uh, uh, orange book, uh, the RTDG harmonized with the global harmonized system, what happened was all the guides for road, rail, air, sea, all of them, the corrosive substances class uh, chapter got changed to follow now the GHS, where we will look at full destruction of skin tissue and also corrosion, but this is the important factor that will determine the concentration level of the acid or the alkaline. So if it falls under packing group one, uh, it's for those kind of concentration levels that causes full skin destruction in less than three minutes over a 60 minute observation. If it is uh, packing group two, that means the concentration is such that you get full destruction of skin tissue in less than 60 in sorry in uh, less than 60 minutes and uh, more than three minutes but less than 60 minutes and in an observation period of 14 days and the packing group three in uh, you start having full skin destruction in more than 60 minutes but less than equal of four hours in an observation period of 14 days so this is how they are defining the packing group and the packing group high danger means concentration level is extremely high that means the acid content in the mixture is very high or the alkaline content in the mixture is very high because uh, class eight is for corrosive substances. So corrosive substances are acids and bases. That's it, these two, depending on the pH level. And then because both of them fall under the same class, that means an alkaline or an acid, an acid like sulfuric acid is an acid, sodium hydroxide is an alkaline. Now, both of this is class eight, but one is an acid, one is an alkaline. You don't keep these two fellows together. They're the worst couple in the world because the minute you keep two packages of an acid and an alkaline, the reaction just starts, starts by keeping them. It starts heating up the whole area because it's trying to do its chain reaction, its chemical reaction. It wants to form into water and salts. That's what happens when you put acid and bases together. The reaction starts and you don't want that to happen. So, Despite acids and alkalines falling under class eight, they must never, ever, ever be kept together, okay? And how acidic or how high is the alkalinity, uh, depending on the pH levels, is how they would uh, indicate the packing groups of the substances by looking at how uh, quickly it, uh, destro it destroys uh, skin tissue. And then we come to the final class, which is class nine. So class nine are for everything other than what we saw as 
manifestation of hazards. That means we saw class one means the hazard that manifests when we test this in the lab is it'll explode. In class two, it's for a type of a substance that is in a gas form and they've broken it into three categories, either flammable, non-flammable or toxic. Then class three is for a substance that is a flammable liquid. That means it has this flashpoint criteria that puts it into a dangerous flammable liquid. And class four are for those that are flammable solids. And there are three criteria. One burns very fast immediately. One takes time to catch burning. And the other one only starts reaction when you hit water to it. Right? That's your class four. Then your phys are the oxidizers. You either have an oxidizing agent in a 5.1 or an organic peroxide of a 5.2. The sixes, uh, 6.1 is a toxic substance. That means it could be a liquid, it could be a, a, a solid, but it's not a gas because a gas is in a 2.3. And a 6.2, which is an infectious substances. Seven is your radioactive material. Eight was your corrosive material. So nine now are where all your articles come in or where it is a dangerous substance, but it does not show any of the eight type of hazards. So an example here, they give you substances which on inhalation as fine dust may endanger your health. So this is a health hazard. It doesn't have the one to eight hazard demonstration, but it's still a hazard to your health. So it's come under class nine, which is a miscellaneous dangerous goods or, supp or substances. Same thing with these substances evolving flammable vapors or GMOs, genetically modified substances. Batteries, because batteries are articles and they contain lithium, which is the dangerous substance. So that's why lithium batteries or any kind of batteries actually, depending what they have. Life-saving appliances. And um, environmentally hazardous substances like engine oil. Certain engine oils, they, they don't fall under the one to eight category. But because it's bad for the environment, it, uh, it could probably destroy um, soil uh, or it travels, it accumulates, and spreads very easily. Then it is an environmental hazard, so it'll come under class nine. And in that, they have given two UN numbers. If it's a solid, it'll be 3077. If it's a liquid, it will be 3082. Also, here are cars, yeah, vehicles, machines. Because if you looked at the DGL on page 195 and 196, um, if you look at 195, you have 3537 articles containing flammable gas, NOS, 3538 articles containing non-flammable, uh, non-toxic gas. And when you turn around or when you turn to DGL page 196, you'll see some more of these various type of articles. So these could be machineries as well. Although there are machineries and there are vehicles and there are UN numbers and we will see them as we move on to part uh, three. Now, looking at the time, it is 11.30. Um, we can do uh, part three in a little bit. And maybe what we will do is we will Stop part three somewhere in the middle and continue again tomorrow because part three is also quite heavy. All right. Now, to end um, the class's slideshow or presentation is the information about marine pollutants. So, marine pollutants is this symbol, right? Dead fish, dead, dead tree, dead fish. So, substances that are construed as marine pollutants, they don't necessarily have to be class nine. You also have substances from different classes. They tested it out because remember the first slide I showed you the, what the lab tech does to identify the hazard class and the name and whatnot. So there are some substances that fall under different classes. And I want you, because I'm going to give a 10 minute break after this, uh, after I finish this, I want you to look at those eight pages of the DGL. And I want you to find um, the UN numbers that indicate um, which substance is a marine pollutant. And how do you identify that? Is whenever a substance is a marine pollutant, you will see this L symbol P in the fourth uh, column of the IMD of the dangerous goods list. When you see this alphabet P, it means that this, you see this UN number? 1051 hydrogen cyanide stabilized. The main hazard class is 6.1. It's a toxic substance. 
The subsidiary hazard is it is a flammable liquid, but we also see a peak, which means that this substance is also a marine pollutant. So a marine pollutant doesn't necessarily have to be a class nine. It could be any other class. We've got to take a look at the DGL. And most importantly, we have to take a look at the safety data sheet. All right, because the DGL gives us a guidance, but only the guy who manufactures and makes the product actually knows what is the product. And how do they do that? They communicate it with the safety data sheet. So I'm going to stop share now, okay? And I'm going to look at your faces and I'm going to ask you all because I was not looking at you. I was going on and on and on and on. And I wanted to know now, I want to know whether you have any questions or not. You can put your mics on. No questions, is it? Did I overwhelm you with information? Yeah. <laughs> you need it. So do you think a 10 minute break is due for us? Right? Yes. So we take, we'll take a 10, 15 minute. So now it's 11.30, 11.45, we come back here on the dot, yeah? Okay. And um, 